the meeting to order. If I could have your attention, please. Um, I understand there's some event across the street that we may have bipartisan absences for. Uh, not sure what it was, but um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me let me do a couple of things first. I want to uh, make some subcommittee assignments. We will be meeting again tomorrow afternoon at three, I think. Uh, members of the committee should have their notices, and I got a little confused on the time last week. I think tomorrow afternoon is at 3, and we'll have a couple of bills on the uh, agenda. I'm going to put some bills in subcommittee now. <clears throat> House Bill 226 um, will be in subcommittee 2. House Bill 233 will be in subcommittee 2. House Bill 259 will be Subcommittee 1. House Bill 270 will be Subcommittee 2. House Bill 276 and 281 both in Subcommittee 1. <clears throat> Any questions about subcommittee assignments? Okay. All right. Today we have, uh, we're taking up House Bill 147. And as I announced last week, this is not for voting today, but simply for a opportunity for the members of the committee to hear, first of all, from the author of the bill, Chairman Mills. And I keep being told he's, there he is, okay. Um, hear from the chairman uh, on this bill. Um, we have a number of people who have signed up. Let me make an announcement and then I'm going to have the, the sign-up sheet put back out. This meeting today will adjourn at 4.30 promptly. Um, and I want to have an opportunity for both sides to be heard as equally as is possible. Um, so those of you, I'm not putting it out there for people to add their names to the list but for people to take their names from the list. Otherwise, we're going to do the best we can to be fair to both sides, and if we can't be, then we'll come back to this bill at some point later in the session, and I'm not sure when. So, have said that, Daniel, Christy, put that. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to take just a minute here to let anybody that wants to come off the list do so before I don't want you to be interrupted when you're making your presentation. Ready, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. We'll call House Bill 147. I recognize the Chairman of the Banking Committee, Chairman Mills, and we're glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I want to thank you for this opportunity uh, to begin the process of talking about House Bill 147. I would like to give a brief synopsis of this bill, and then I'll be glad to try to answer any of your questions. Uh, the bill simply uh, amends the Women's Right to Know Act that passed through this body in 2005. And basically, the portion that it amends, it uh, requires that an ultrasound uh, be performed uh, prior to uh, an abortion. It does not require that the patient view the ultrasound. It does require that the ultrasound be performed 
and that the ultrasound be offered uh, to the patient for a viewing uh, for several reasons. One, under current law, a doctor has to, under the Woman's Right to Know Act, has to inform the patient the probable gestational age. We now have the technology that can even not only surpass words, but can give you a picture which is has been said worth more than a thousand words at times, uh, which I think would provide uh, great relief from our physicians in, in a situation where they might be held liable for not disclosing all the facts. So we have the technology available through an ultrasound which gives the diagnosis and the confirmation of an early pregnancy through an ultrasound. It determines the gestational age and the assessment of the size uh, of the child. It also allows for a diagnosis of any uh, malformations that may be uh, existence or believed to be in existence. Uh, it gives the placental uh, localization uh, for the doctor and the patient as well. Uh, it can also determine uh, whether or not there are multiple pregnancies uh, rather than guessing. Uh, in, in my research, every abortion clinic that advertises on the internet that I've been able to find is currently doing an ultrasound. What they are not currently doing is providing full disclosure to the patient in which those ultrasounds are being performed. And I have pulled down off the internet, uh, if you'd like to see, several uh, internet sites that actually where they cite on the internet that they provide the ultrasound and in some cases they even go as far to cite why they feel it's important to provide an ultrasound. I'm reading from Atlanta Surgical Center which uh, is a clinic that provides abortion and they say in their advertisement which I've printed off here it says every woman who is a patient at the Atlanta Surgical Center will have an ultrasound. I'm reading from another clinic which says on day one or on the day of your first appointment you will go through a pre-procedural assessment which includes having an ultrasound, vital sign and blood testing, medical consultation, counseling session. I'm reading from another one. Uh, this is from Dunwoody Women's Medical Group and it says every patient will have an ultrasound. And one last one not to bore you but uh, this one is from the Feminist Women's Health Center uh, and it reads um, after personal uh, counseling, a preoperative medical review, including an ultrasound and a blood test, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I'm saying to the members of this committee is that ultrasounds are already being done, I believe, uh, by those who take uh, medicine in the most serious manner. And that is that whether you are uh, pro-life or pro-choice, that is not what this bill is about. This is full disclosure of all the facts to the patient. And it does require that an ultrasound uh, be performed and be offered. The question comes in as to, well, how much will this cost? Well, if it's already being done, there's already a cost in place. Uh, Medicaid already covers uh, that cost through federal dollars. What we've done in this bill is we have specifically listed on page 3 uh, of the bill, lines 30 through 33, that uh, the clinics will have to provide a geographical list uh, which provides free ultrasounds. Uh, and in a folder that you received, there's actually a map uh, that looks something like this, where it diagrams the abortion facilities that are currently in the state, and then it also diagrams uh, the facilities that we're aware of, there are many more than this, but these are ones that we're aware of, that offer uh, free ultrasounds already. So cost is not really an issue, as a matter of fact, it's a savings. And uh, this bill does uh, also uh, add to the current law on page 
uh, 7, lines 10 through 12, that any person who purposefully, knowingly, or recklessly performs or attempts to perform or induce an abortion without complying with the existing law, chapter 9A of Title 31, shall be punished as for a misdemeanor. And I do believe this is an important part uh, of the proposed bill because it, it puts some teeth in there. Otherwise, we don't know if it's being done or not. Um, and, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not going to belabor myself at this point. That's a general overview. I'll be happy to address any questions the members may have. Chairman Mills, um, and, and, and maybe I should have offered some explanation earlier uh, for my position on the timing today. We have other meetings going on, first of all. And secondly, it's my it's the Chair's feeling that out of respect to all of those who have an interest in this issue, I think last year, as you know, Mr. Chairman, we devoted um, uh, innumerable hours to the, the similar bill last year, many of which were late at night. And this year it's not my intention to uh, spend late at night hours on something this Im important, whichever side you're on. Let me ask you, if you would, um, Chairman Mills, sort of <clears throat> walk us through briefly I know I have an interest in this, to how this bill in its current form differs from what was introduced, I think, by you and others last year, or maybe the session before, I can't remember, but it was considered by this committee uh, late last session. Uh, I'll give it my best effort, Mr. Chairman. I can't hardly don't remember mean to put what you happened on the spot. yesterday. Uh, so I, I would really, if you don't mind, I'd like to address this bill, but I can tell you the ones that I remember. It didn't have the penalty in it, as I remember, last year, uh, which I just cited to you. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, it did not have uh, uh, it did not have the fact that this be a, a live ultrasound. Uh, and that is a little bit different. And the reason for that is uh, what we have discovered is that sometimes ultrasounds are done and they're done in such a way that uh, it doesn't present or disclose all the facts. And clearly, ultrasounds that are medically accepted across uh, the medical community is an ultrasound that uh, is not a vague picture, but we have the technology to give a very clear picture uh, which gives a doctor the truer sense of the gestational age, the size of, uh, of the formation of the child, et cetera, et cetera, which actually in the long run, uh, I think, helps the clinic and protects the doctor. Uh, but more importantly, <coughs> lets the patient make a more informed decision. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to stop here and, and allow <coughs> members of the committee, if they desire, to ask questions of Chairman Mills. Tell me your number. Oh, you, okay. Representative Bearden. Trying to find a button. Turn this on. Okay. It's on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Chairman Mills, on <clears throat> page 3, line 16, subsection B. You got it? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, it states that she has a right to view and active ultrasound of the unborn child and hear the heartbeat. That says she has the right. Page 4, line 10 through 12. The female certifies in writing, and then we go to page 10 towards the end, that she viewed the ultrasound imaging. Page 3 says she has the right. Page 4, she signed on a certificate saying she did view it. So does she has a does she got the right to view it, or am I misinterpreting this? Uh, everyone has the right to view it. Uh, she also has the right to decline viewing it. Okay, because that that part's not in. Is it? Did I not read all the way down? Not to view. Or decide. 
Or if this person read the finishing part of the sentence, I probably can answer my own question there, can I? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That answer your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, kind of one part. Representative Levitas. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Um, what is the Medical Association of Georgia's position on this? Have they given an official position on the provisions of, of this bill? I could not speak to that. Uh, frankly, I didn't draft it uh, at their request, or nor have I asked them uh, are they for it or against it. And uh, of course, each of us as legislators practice a different way. It's been my philosophy to, uh, you know, respond to the constituency first that I represent, and then of course I do like to hear from those positions. But I, I do not know and couldn't state their position. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Brother uh, Representative Abrams. Uh, there's not a fiscal note. However, in the rules of the House, it does state that clearly if it's not a uh, fiscal impact of a large denomination, then we do not have to do that. And since uh, currently we're already printing that, uh, that's why I really included it in the Women's Right to Know Act, so that we wouldn't have two separate forms being printed, but incorporated into one, which would actually be a, a savings. Sure. It's really not a substantial change at all. It's a very minor change. Uh, it could simply say, add it on, which were you offered the right to view the ultrasound or were you not, and then you sign it. So as simple as they would like to develop at DHR, it's a very minor change. And it, you know, it's been my experience in the legislature that things that are really of importance to us, uh, we find a way for funding, and this would be so minor in the grand scheme of things, while it certainly is a very fair uh, and forthright question, uh, if if I were the speaker, and I'm not, nor do I want to be, uh, if I were asked to rule on did this come under uh, the rule that exists in the House rules that it doesn't have a large financial impact, I would have to give an honest ruling and say that it does not because it's so minimal. Who was next? Any other questions from uh, Representative Abdul Salam? Mr. Chairman, um, you want to get the boot down, Christy? Yeah, if, if I may, I, I have a, a couple of um, questions, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, one, uh, does this bill also require agencies or, or uh, facilities that are not performing abortions to uh, comply? Any facility that performs an abortion would have to comply with this, as they currently do with the Women's Right to Know Act. But I'm saying facilities that don't perform abortions, are they also required to do the same? No. If they, if they do not uh, currently perform an abortion, uh, then they don't, they don't have to comply with this act because there's nothing to comply with. And maybe that leads to my, my second question then. What is the hope uh, or the benefit of showing this ultrasound? The, the benefit is uh, long-fold, many-fold. Uh, one is, uh, as a patient who is making a very important decision, uh, we believe they should have full disclosure of all the facts. And uh, for instance, uh, let's say that someone were to say, well, isn't this a little traumatic? You're asking someone who may have gone through rape or through incest situation 
uh, to look at this picture of this child inside of them, a couple of things come into play. One is the bill is drafted in, in such a way that they have the right to decline. Everybody. And I don't think you can create two separate classes of people that uh, one person who's been victimized in a tragic, horrible way uh, and not offer them the same right to say yes or no to a viewing that you offer to everyone else. I think the greatest tragedy would probably come when you said to a rape or incest victim who's been uh, gone through a horrible trauma, had their rights to, to say yes or no taken away from them, and then you do it again and traumatize them again by not being fully informed in the decision that they're about to make, which will have long-lasting impact uh, on their lives. I, 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 I guess I'm just slow. I'm, I'm still not understanding what seeing the ultrasound will do. Well, uh, let me go back. First of all, they don't have to see it. They do have to perform it. So then the physician would say to them, would you like to see the ultrasound? The patient could then say, no, uh, I've gone through horrible experiences. I, I don't want to see it. Uh, I have enough information to make a decision. Or they could say, you know, I, I'd like to see this. That's their choice. And uh, I, I think every person should have the right to make that choice. Only if they're considering an abortion. No, I, I don't know of any practicing uh, medical doctor that delivers babies that doesn't do ultrasounds already. However, it's, uh, you know, in my understanding, it's not law. But I, I do think in this situation they should have all the facts shared with them Thank prior you. to making a decision. Thank you. Representative Randall, what's your number? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Mills, um, I think I'm having deja vu here, but can you tell me you say that the reason for this bill is so that the patient can be informed. What is it that the ultrasound is going to inform this patient of that this patient isn't already aware of? The patient, one, knows they're pregnant. Two, knows that they're probably not in a position to go through with the pregnancy. What else will the ultrasound reveal to that patient that this patient does not already know? Well, they don't know the gestational age. Uh, it would be a doctor's best guess. That's why the ultrasound is in existence today in virtually every uh, doctor's office that sees pregnant women. Uh, secondly, it would give them a, a diagnosis of the child as to whether there are any uh, malformations or, or any abnormalities uh, that could be viewed. It would also um, uh, give them uh, a total picture of their safety, you know, uh, where is the baby located at in the womb? Uh, is it uh, in a dangerous situation? Is it not? Is it just a few weeks along? Is it several months? The, the, the ultrasound actually gives a very defined, pinpointed answer to otherwise theories. So it's your understanding that when a patient comes in and they have made the decision that they want to have an abortion, that they have no idea how far along they are? And this ultrasound is needed, definitely needed to tell them that. And I think the ultrasound is, is needed. Uh, first of all, the, the abortion clinics are agreeing with me because they're already doing the ultrasounds. So, so they're not objecting to the ultrasounds. And frankly, only they could answer as to why they're doing it. Uh, my, my theory is one of the reasons why they're doing it is they're trying to comply with the existing law. And when you've got technology that's able to give you a pretty definite gestational probable age of a baby and you don't use it, I think that it would be great grounds for them to be liable if they didn't use it. And frankly, I think that's why they're, they're using it. The, and the issue is that they're just not showing it to the patient or even yeah. offering a showing. Okay. And, and this bill still does say that it's required that they show the patient the ultrasound? No, no, it's it changed. Clearly defines that they only offer the viewing, and the patient has the right to 
decline to view it or to say, yes, I would like to view it. And you think this bill is absolutely necessary? I, I do. Thank you. Representative Levitas was next, and then Representative Abrams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I noticed you said in response uh, to Representative Randall's comments that you know abortion clinics may themselves be in a position where they're liable, and that they're agreeing with you because they've already undertaken to do the the, the, the sonograms as it is the ultrasounds. If, has anybody from the clinics approached you and asked you to sponsor this legislation? And, and have, if not, have you talked to them about the, the legislation itself? No one from the abortion clinics have, have approached me and asked me to introduce this. And basically, I'm standing on behalf of the patients advocating their rights that I think if a facility, a medical facility, has the technology available to them, to give as close as diagnosis and all the facts to the patient, then I, I think they should disclose that to the patient. And, and that was my next question. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, are you aware of situations in which patients are requesting to see um, either individual on a broad scale, requesting to see these ultrasounds that are being taken and they're being denied that right? Do you have, have you had that situation? And, and if not, then I'm just trying to figure out what this is trying to cure. In other words, the clinics are not denying that opportunity and the ultrasounds, as you say, are already being taken. I'm trying to figure out what problem we're trying to cure here. And, and related to that is if, in fact, this is a reasonable provision to have in the context of abortion, wouldn't, it, wouldn't that same logic extend to the non-abortion context that all patients should have that opportunity to have that ultrasound that we should, if you're going to apply misdemeanor punishment, that should be applied to doctors who fail to give that opportunity in the context of regular checkups in the non-abortion context? Well, I, I mean, the law clearly states that uh, we have different laws in place for abortion clinics. That's a given. Uh, and, and I would be amenable to the laws being applied equally across the board. If the abortion clinics had to go through the same type of scrutiny that other medical clinics, I, I would be glad to co-sign with you on that bill and, and help get it through the House and the, and the Senate. Uh, but there are separate laws in place for that. And, um, you know, clearly uh, this bill does provide a penalty. That is a change because I think it it is very important to put some teeth in the bill so that they can't just say, well, yeah, we offered it when in fact they didn't. Right, and, and I guess and there is an existing situation of which you're aware where abortion clinics are routinely denying their patients an opportunity when requested to do the sonograms? I'm, I'm assuming that's what this bill is trying to address is that situation. That is correct. Now, uh, I've not personally gone through that experience, of course. Uh, it is reported to me, yes, on multiple occasions over and over again. Because I, I think it would be helpful, I know for me, I don't know about other members of the committee, if we could have some of that anecdotal evidence to consider when considering your bill. I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, the, the time you've given me. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your candid response. The, the evidence is there and does exist that when the viewing is offered, that it does alter the decision that the patient makes. Uh, our own former Senator uh, Zell Miller, who, who testifies in his whole change of position, goes back to not a debate on the floor uh, of uh, Congress or not a debate that took place in a committee. He goes back to the ultrasound that he saw of his grandchild that, that gave him all the facts that a picture was worth more than a thousand words. And so, so I think a patient being fully disclosed, having all the facts, you know, Roe v. Wade has already been decided. This is not an, uh, an abortion pro-life issue. This is about disclosing all the facts to the patient. I can't imagine a doctor, if I had broken my hand, taking the x-ray, he tells me my hand is broken, and then he doesn't show me the x-ray. I can't imagine that. Uh, what I can imagine is, doctor, I'd like to verify that it's the, the middle metacarpal bone in my hand that's been broken. Can you show it to me? Sure, I'd be glad to. Got it right here. I'm going to charge you for it anyway. You might as well take a look at it. And then he shows it to me. Or I can say, I really don't want to see that. Just fix it. 
But you didn't need to bill in that case, right? You just asked your doctor, and he gladly said, sure, here's the x-ray. Right, thus validating your earlier point that there's a separate set of standards in place for different clinics. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your responses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Representative Abrams, and then Chairman Franklin. child we have four children at my house every child that my wife has been pregnant with I got to go view a live viewing of the ultrasound it was not withheld from my wife or me it was offered to me now you go into an abortion clinic and ultrasounds are being performed as we already shared but they're not being even offered to be viewed that's the clear point that I'm making Yes. And the problem is, is that that's already being done by any physician who's a reputable physician. Uh, it, it's already being done. And it's already being done among the abortion clinics that we see. The difference is one offers the viewing and, and the other does not. Mr. Chairman, we have, I have a doctor physician here, uh, Dr. Blakow, that can speak to this issue, I think, a little more definitively than I, uh, if I could ask, and, and she may be more up to the law, the speed of the law in that regard, if I could ask her to respond to that. Sure. Is she still in the room? If you would come over to the podium. You would come around to the podium, please. And just identify yourself and what you practice. I think you joined us last year. I did. I did. My name is Dr. Laura Bleakroad. I'm a pediatrician in Alpharetta. I have been practicing pediatrics for about 17 years. I went to Emory Medical School and the University of Minnesota Residency Program. Um, obviously, as a pediatrician, I don't perform ultrasounds in my office. I think I would describe the answer to your question specifically as a standard of care. It is a standard of care that OBGYN practices perform ultrasounds the first obstetric visit for just any patient and it's expected and people do get in trouble uh, doctors do get in trouble that's not me I don't think because uh, they um, if they don't offer if they don't do that and good heavens if you've ever had an ultrasound and I've had probably 30 to 40 because I've had 10 pregnancies I have eight children and two miscarriages 
but going through that, the ultrasound machine is facing your way. I think I could perform them in my office. I think that's practically a course in performing ultrasounds, but maybe not. But the machines turn towards you. You hear the heartbeat. When they start, you hear your heartbeat because first they're fishing around looking for the baby's heartbeat. And it is information. And mature women who are going in and trying to make a decision about themselves and their bodies really should have all of the facts and all of the information in front of them when they're trying to make that kind of decision. When I call it a standard of care, women who show up at an OB office because they know they're pregnant and they're excited about that and they want to do the best for their baby and have good care are different than women who are scared, maybe alone, maybe confused, who knows what, and probably aren't going to jump out into society and say, you know what, when I went and had my abortion, nobody offered me this and I'm kind of mad about it. I hope some women who have experienced that will go forward and say it. But in my experience with people, is when they feel a little more confused and scared, it's hard to stand up and take a stand and, and maybe complain about something. It's hard to complain about something if you don't have gobs of guts and a little Irish in you. That's just the way it goes. And I do have both. I'm a Murphy. All right. Can I go on with the rest of them? Is that uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I, I would prefer at this point in time, I, uh, we okay. want to hear from you later Sorry. on, that you give the assistance the chairman wanted. And I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay. You want to direct a question to her? If I could just based on what you made her Okay. Um, I guess my question is, there's not currently a legal cause of action for... Not being an OB, I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. Not being an obstetrician, I do not have an answer for what the legal, what they sign on their liability insurance. I know it's a standard of care, which is a major statement in the medical community. If something's a standard of care, you and you get sued over it, you don't have a leg to stand on. No. Um, once again, because I think that you don't have the same level of uh, people willing to jump out and say when it's not happening. So I think that saying it's a necessity and a requirement is different than saying it's a standard of care. I think in an otherwise healthy population, women who are pregnant and choosing to advocate for their baby from beginning till birth um, are in a different place and are more willing to point out deficiencies in their care and more aware of what deficiencies in their care are. That helps you. Okay. The um, Chairman Franklin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Mills, what, uh, what will the ultrasound confirm? Is there any particular fact or biological fact that the ultrasound will confirm to the woman? Well, I think it confirms a lot of things. Uh, one, it, it confirms a pregnancy exists. Uh, the other things that I've already mentioned, such as uh, the doctor earlier mentioned that the heartbeat of the mother, the heartbeat of the child itself, the probable gestational age, uh, the, the fetal position, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that we referred to earlier. Yeah, I appreciate that. Then you said that the the first thing you mentioned was that a pregnancy exists. Is that pregnancy that she's uh, carrying a child? Yes. Is that child a human person? Well, that would be a matter of each person to, to determine themselves. You're asking me, and of course my response to that is yes. And does the state owe a duty to that child? Again, that's a matter of interpretation, Representative Franklin. My interpretation is that uh, the Constitution of the state of Georgia says that we have a right to every citizen, and I would count that person as a citizen. But that's my interpretation. I understand there are a lot who do not interpret that way. And uh, my concern in presenting this ultrasound bill is that we don't slip into a, a pro-life, pro-choice debate because Roe v. Wade has not been overturned. It is still the law of the land, whether you like it or not. And this bill, uh, bills like it have already been passed in other states throughout the United States, have withheld Supreme Court scrutiny. And I simply would like to see that come to Georgia. Thank you. Representative Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Mills, how many years have you
served in the General Assembly? Well, let's see. It's not on page six or seven, <laughs> but uh, 15 years, I think. 15 years. Have you been involved in a debate over the medical scope of practice and standard of care for doctors performing the removal of a gallbladder? Is there, is there, has that ever been a discussion you've been a part of in the General Assembly? I haven't had legislation along those lines, and so I can't say that I, that I have. I've heard other members discuss it, but certainly it seems like it has come to the forefront here in this discussion more than uh, at other times. And, I, you know, it's uh, no one talks about the standard of care about showing an X-ray of a hand, as I referred to earlier. What's really different about this issue? I mean, what's, what is it that makes this issue either create more interest or an issue of um, greater tension or conflict in the, con in the context of passing laws governing a scope of practice or governing how a certain medical procedures are performed? Well, I think it's probably the, the debate uh, of the pro-life, pro-choice, uh, whatever you want to call it. But again, that's not what is at hand here. What is at hand here is not going to determine, it's not changing that law. What it is saying is fully disclose to the patient all the facts so they can make a well-informed decision. It's been my experience while serving in the legislature. If you give people the facts, they are much smarter than we often believe they are, and they can make wise decisions. I think it is a great injustice to have facts and withhold those facts and then ask the patient to make an uninformed decision, which is a critical decision that can affect two people for a long time. And Chairman Wills, I asked the question, and I would just encourage the members of the committee to consider carefully as, as we discuss this. The real difference is, you know, we're not talking about, or I would submit we're not talking about just a, a surgical procedure on a glob of tissue, which really in the balance here is human life. And when does human life begin? And what is the value of a human life? Um, and you submitted earlier, as you, as you made your presentation, you believe um, that, that the life in utero is, in fact, a human life. Um, it's my understanding, and I've done some research, as I'm sure many in this audience have, um, that heart rate um, typically starts about six to eight weeks of gestational age, um, and that from the moment of conception, actually from the moment of, of fertilization, um, all the factor, all the parts and all the chromosomes and all the genetic material and all the conditions exist, given nourishment and given a safe environment for that human being to grow to full adulthood and die of old age. Now, I currently, the only things I need personally as a 36-year-old as a male is nourishment and a safe environment to live to a ripe old age. Those same conditions exist in the womb, nourishment, and a safe environment to live to a ripe old age. And I think when we look in the context of most abortions being performed at 10 to 12 weeks, uh, the heartbeat um, happening at 6 to 8 weeks, all the genetic things involved in that human life from the moment of fertilization, I think as you look, in fact, if you were to look at um, a medical text and you look at the 10 or 12 things that doctors look at to establish, is this person alive, are they comatose, are they dead, you know, the things coroners look at, to establish life, those things profoundly exist in utero, and I think that's the discussion. It's not a matter of, of um, sort of side issues. It's a matter of when does life begin and what is the value of that life. And I do, I do have one final question for you, Chairman. Um, you know, in the context of, of, of young women who've come to me um, who work for me in the past in counseling and um, express grave concern that they weren't empowered with information um, the point that they chose to, to go through with an abortion that they later had after having had the abortion, um, I asked the question, if we're truly seeking to empower women, and it's my understanding that in many cases um, the, the, the accusations made of you that you're seeking to somehow interrupt women's lives, their choices, their medical decisions, by undermining their empowerment to make decisions for themselves, are we not really empowering them to make a decision through this act, and is this decision not bigger than just a gallbladder surgery, but really the very question of life itself? 
Is, is that not, would you not agree with that, Chairman Bill? Representative Sutton, so I, I do agree with that, and I, and I believe what we're clearly talking about here is why is it that every other medical procedure that is performed in all the medical uh, field, there's never any information withheld? Why is it we're given options when somebody has cancer? Do you want chemo? Do you want to try to tough it out yourself? Do you want to, you're given all the options. Do you want to try experimental treatment? Do you want to, but this one procedure, this one procedure, information is withheld. And as far as the, the cost to taxpayers, I would submit to this committee that there will be tremendous savings if this bill passes on the basis of Women will be made aware there are free ultrasounds that can be done. Medicaid bills will not be charged, which will be paid by the taxpayers through federal taxes, which would now be saved, which in the end would result in a tax uh, savings to the taxpayers. But more importantly, women would have just the right to make a fully informed decision. Representative Collins and then Representative Randall. Thanks, Chairman Mills, for being here. Um, just in our discussion, wouldn't you not say that this is a, and I know your background and, and others, that what we're talking about here is a very difficult decision in a sense of there's a lot of factors in play yes. for a woman and a doctor in, in, in processing this? Yes. Okay. That also, would you agree that possibly that there is also a state interest in not only preservation of life here, but also in a a discussion of knowing that there is these uh, philosophical differences out there. Yes. Okay. I want to read something to you and see if this will sort of capture this. It stated, even in the earliest stages of pregnancy, the state may enact rules and regulations designed to encourage her to know that there are philosophical and social arguments of great weight that can be brought to bear in favor of continuing the pregnancy to full term, and that there are procedures and institutions to allow adoption of unwanted children as well as a certain degree of state assistance if the mother chooses to raise the child herself. It follows that the state is free to enact laws to provide a reasonable framework for a woman to make a decision that has such a profound and lasting meaning. Would you tend to agree with that statement? I, I would. I think these are life-altering decisions, and I can't imagine not being given all the facts that I might weigh all the options before I make a life-altering decision. And for those who may want to say, well, in the case of rape or the incest, I, I would submit to the members of the committee, that is a false argument. And it is not intellectual. It is not academically supported because they have the right to decline viewing of the ultrasound. So they are not forced to do anything. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I think you stand in good company in that because that is the decision out of the Casey decision that was the majority decision that, that basically found that this uh, is an informed decision. It's, it's an issue of information. It's an issue of knowing that there are philosophical and uh, social arguments on both sides of this, and I appreciate the question. Thank you. Representative Randall. Mr. Chairman, um, I just have a, I don't know, it just, I, for one, I'm always amazed when a male comes uh, with legislation that can never affect him directly. That, that, that's one. Uh, the other part, uh, I have a couple of questions. I mean, this is being portrayed as a bill that uh, is to address the standard of care when it comes to uh, these type of procedures. Um, but I also fi find it to be very insulting to women, simply because it basically says this has to be done because when women make the decision to, to actually get up the nerve and I'm sure after agonizing uh, to get to this decision that this is the, the right decision for their lives, it's insulting to think that they don't have all the information. They don't know what's going on with them. And so this ultrasound absolutely necessarily has to be done for them to know what's going on with their body. So I, I think this, this is totally insulting to all women uh, because, believe it or not, we know what's going on with us. We, we live with it. We live with it. We have pain with it. We, we just live with it, and uh, so it's, it's totally insulting. But, uh, but going back to the standard of care, um, you know, if this is standard of care, I just can't see why this wouldn't be um, expanded to all obstetric, obstetric care facilities and providers. Um, 
because if in, indeed if that's your goal um, and and I think that question's been br asked and brought up several times but I'm not quite sure if uh, I got a solid support uh, from you that that should be done that that should be extended I mean why not why, why pick and choose which facilities that this should be extended to um, you know and and again you know this is a decision that uh, I don't think any woman takes lightly. And yes, the change from last year is that they are offered the opportunity. They're not forced to look at this ultrasound. Um, but I'm still wondering whether the basis for this bill is to that last ditch effort to allow this person to change their mind. And I really think this is what this bill is all about. I, th I think it total. I think standard of care is just is just a twist here. Um, but, you know, I still have to ask you, why shouldn't this be extended to all providers? Representative Randall, uh, simply, to, to put it in a nutshell, uh, they're already operating off a higher standard level of care than the abortion clinics are. That, that's just in a simple, hard, true fact that our existing uh, physicians that are operating off of a standard of level of care, they ha abortion clinics have not always offered ultrasound. This has only been since we had this discussion in the past couple of years that they've started offering this, and also since the passage of the Women's Right to Know Bill. And Representative Randall, I, I have, you know, you're my colleague in the House. I hope I, I'll respect each and every member, uh, and I want to keep it along the substance of the issue. But, but I do feel it necessary to respond. Uh, it, it really disturbs me that you would make a statement that says that an abortion does not affect a male. No, uh, I, said, there, I said directly. Uh, uh, right, directly. There's, there's several reasons why I would Meaning that a male can never have an abortion. That there's several answers that I would like to at least give you my view of that is, number one, if it involves a male child, it certainly affects that male. Number two, the female, a husband or a wife, or whether they're married or not married, uh, pregnancy does not occur by itself. It occurs with two people, a man and a female. And that means that chromosomes from a male and a female are working together to form that baby. And so to say that that the male is totally disenfranchised when it's his chromosomes as well as hers, uh, you know, I, I would disagree. And I know you understand that. And, and it is very yeah, I, fair I think you misunderstood what I said directly. If, if I can finish, it's a very fair statement for you to say that women have to go through a whole lot more than men do. And I would add an exclamation point to that many fold. But I, I, I do want you to see at least uh, I'm doing this because uh, I think people need to be aware of all the facts before they make a critical decision. So would you be, would you be in support of a, an amendment that uh, extend this to all um, care, obstetric care providers? Well, that amendment would not be germane. We're dealing with uh, uh, the Woman's Right to Know Act, and that does not deal with those portions of the law. And clearly it would not be germane. That would be up to the chairman of this committee to rule on ultimately, and then if it were to make it beyond this point, it would be up to the Speaker of the House to rule on. But my limited knowledge that that would not be germane. Representative Abdul Salam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, asked the question, what would the ultrasound show? Um, and I was uh, struck profoundly by the doctor's comment about a mature woman making such decisions when we know that most times they're not mature women. Um, I'm also struck with the fact that you seem to think that these professional standards of care are meted out across the board when I know hundreds and hundreds of cases where it's not. 
um, that's just my experiences, not yours. Uh, but they're happening every day. There are not these expectations of these standards of care. There are people <coughs> that we had to actually go in and threaten to show a patient a stomach x-ray, to do a stomach x-ray. So these standards are just some kind of myth in some parts of, of the state, I think. So we can't say we don't need it, uh, a, a mandate in other areas. I would think that any woman carrying any child would be entitled to have the same standards of care. Um, and you need to understand, you need to understand that there has been much agony, much prayer, and much uh, conflict before that woman gets to the abortion clinic. So therefore, um, when they go to a regular obst obstetrician, if they go, because I know too many that don't get any prenatal care, but all of them should be afforded the same opportunity. And if that ultrasound is going to show you, see, I'm not that smart. I can't look at an ultrasound and tell a doggone thing. I've got one now that's due in May, my daughter. I look at the ultrasound, oh, it's cute, what is it? It, it doesn't show me anything. And I'm just being very honest with you. I don't know anybody in this room that can look at an ultrasound and tell whether there's something wrong. So again, I ask you, what will the ultrasound show? And if it shows that, why would it not be done in regular medical settings? It already is done in regular medical settings. In some. As a, as a standard in some. of care. In some. Uh, ultrasounds show a tremendous amount. I, I read off a whole list. I'll be glad to read them again. But every day, uh, babies' lives are saved because of a, a, a prenatal diagnosis that's found because of an ultrasound. But what would I see? Well, you would see what the ultrasound reveals to you. You would, first of all, hear the heartbeat. We hear that pain. anyway. Well, what you can't hear is you can't hear the regularity of the heartbeat. Sure you can. And by ear, you cannot hear. Sure you can. The, it depends on the age uh, of the child at the time of the pregnancy. <laughs> and so what an ultrasound does is it allows you to even go further back to the point of the conception of life as far as you can go and, and find out, pinpoint. And so it, it makes many more options available. And that happens, that's happening right now, every day. What options, Chairman Neal? I mean, I'm not being dumb. I'm, I'm really not understanding you. That there are hope, when, when somebody does an ultrasound, a physician does an ultrasound, he can tell you the, the probable gestational age of that child which lets that mother begin to plan and know the options that, that she's got to decide. He can tell by that also if the, uh, if the, the makeup of the child, any, any abnormalities are there in many cases. He can tell where the baby is being carried uh, in the pregnancy and is the baby's head up or is it down? Is it a situation we need to watch? Does she need to be uh, asked to, to, to stay in the bed? for the safety of her and the child, or, or is it okay for her to be up walking around? Uh, you know, those are just a few, and again, I'm, I'm sure. But an ultrasound is not needed to tell you any of those things. Part of the thing that it is. we need to know, we know that for generations, I mean from the beginning of time, a doctor could tell you your due date. That's the same thing. I'm, I'm not being argumentative, I'm just stating fact. You can tell as a mother carrying that child, where that head is. Any women in here have children, you know. You know whether you're carrying it up how you... Look, the grandmothers in the neighborhood can tell you whether you're carrying it up high or down low. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth. No, I'm not trying to be funny. Please, Mr. Chairman, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just stating the truth. So I still don't know what I, as a mother, would look at an ultrasound and be expected to learn. I just quickly try to respond to that. With an ultrasound, you can tell a number of things that, with all due respect to grandmas, <laughs> I've got to. Uh, <laughs> you, you can tell, first of all, and not be surprised on the day of the birth that, oh, we got to go buy two baby cribs. Well, yeah, you can uh, tell that now with uh, heartbeat. We got to, no, not, not in a lot of situations. Uh, let the, chip, let the, the, let the speaker finish his answer. The ultrasound <clears throat> reveals a lot of things that cannot be detected with the human eye. and. Uh, you're correct in that a lot of those things can be diagnosed with the hand or, or just by common knowledge, but uh, 
certainly uh, we've got a lot more technology available to us which gives us 3D and 4D ultrasounds which can tell us the form and where you're talking about where you can't look at the ultrasound. If you were to use a higher definition ultrasound, you could even see when the baby is as small as a quarter. You can even see the fingers, each finger on that child that's in formation. You can see the arm, the wrist, you can see the leg, you can even see its internal organs. And you cannot see that with just an outside view. I cannot see it on the ultrasound posted on my refrigerator now. That, that's right, and that's why we're saying in this legislation it should be a live ultrasound, which would allow you to see those things that I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank both of you. Uh, before I recognize the next question, let me sort of announce where we are. Um, I wanted the committee to have the benefit of questioning the author today, and I think we're having a good discussion. Um, and I'm going to allow that to continue until the hour of 4.30, as I'd indicated. And I don't think that, and, and, and if, I hope you'll come back and answer further questions if they have some more, although I hope this will be a good, thorough opportunity for, for you to be uh, uh, questioned, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> but I don't think we're going to go, well, I know we're not going to go to the sign-up sheet today. Uh, we'll do that at the next meeting. So just to let you know where we are in terms of planning. With that, the next questioner is Representative Levitas, to be followed by Representative Setzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and my apologies to those of you in the audience for whom uh, you came here to speak, and we've taken that time away from you today. I hope you will come back when, when the Chairman allows it. This is obviously a very important discussion and, and spirited, and, and, and I'll, I hope it continues to be respectful uh, in the discourse on both sides. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your... Your, your patience with our questions and, and your willingness to respond to them candidly. Um, I have just one question. I promise not to ask you any more today. Um, I know, in response to, I think it was Representative Randall's question, you mentioned the situation that might involve a cancer, uh, a cancer patient and his or her doctor. And, and I wondered if you might not be able to apply the same logic again to that situation. If you have a cancer patient who's maybe uh, in diagnosis as a terminal patient and uh, the doctor has decided that there are certain treatments that he or she considers to be too risky, um, that the pain might be too much pain to outweigh the potential benefits, um, or they don't agree with the standard of care, wouldn't that same logic apply and dictate that we should have a statute requiring them to divulge all of those potential possibilities along with a uh, punishment for a misdemeanor if they fail to do that? Wouldn't that same logic apply in that situation? Certainly not. And the reason being is this. When you go to an abortion clinic, you're going there with one thing in mind. And, and, and the doctor is there with one thing in mind. So he's already there practicing for a specific purpose. Uh, the, the, hopefully, if you have cancer and you go to a physician, you know, his idea in mind is to keep you alive as long as he can. And so he presents all the options out there and then lets you decide. He tells you all the facts. And what I'm saying to you is when a person goes into an abortion clinic, why do we withhold information from them? And yet we're performing that, that procedure, the ultrasound. Why in this case would we withhold it? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you. Representative Setzler. I'd like to hold my question um, for an another person testifying that, that is making a positive case against what Representative Mills is, is suggesting. I I'd like to hear a case made as to why an ultrasound shouldn't be taken, and I'd like to question that person. So I'll, I'll hold my question until later. Any other members of the committee have questions for Chairman Mills? Chairman Cooper. Chairman Mills, didn't we, when we did the woman's right to know, we do have the 24-hour waiting period, but we did have it where women could call in so that and get the information they wanted to go to a website and, board and so forth. Doesn't this add where it have to be done 24 hours beforehand? No, it does not. Uh, they have to be informed 
about the ultrasound 24 hours in advance. It does not require, it, it, this mimics the woman's right to know language, and it does not add uh, that extra step in there. And on page three, uh, line 10 through 22, I believe that answers. Okay, what about Did you have a follow up? No. Okay. Further questions, uh, members of the committee, for Chairman Mills? Representative Setzler, I don't have a real problem accommodating that. I don't know. We have 17 people signed up to speak on this bill. I made my comments a few minutes ago because I thought that was the fair thing to do. If the members of the and I don't know who's, I suspect I might know one or two how they feel about the bill. Um, but others I don't. Um, so uh, it, it, does the committee have any objection in the remaining 14 or 13 minutes we have to hearing an opponent of this bill speak? And we will have further meetings. Hearing none, does anyone wish to speak in opposition to this bill? We'll recognize one. Okay, very fine. If you'll come around, please, and identify yourself. Thank you, Chairman Mills. You got away without me recognizing you. Okay, thank you. Tell us who you are, please. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Carrie Swiak. I'm an assistant professor of gynecology and obstetrics at the Emory University School of Medicine. I have a master's in public health in epidemiology as well from the Emory Rollins School of Public Health. Uh, I do oppose. Uh, House Bill 147 for several reasons. Um, I certainly uh, advocate full disclosure to women in any situation before any medical procedure or any medical uh, circumstance. I don't, I have not seen any evidence that uh, information has been withheld in this clinical circumstance. Um, therefore, I do not see that there's currently a public health risk. Uh, if there was a, a legitimate public health risk, then I would uh, certainly be advocating for leadership or legislation to mandate. Um, several national medical bodies, including the FDA, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and the Association of Reproductive Health Professionals, have published guidelines and protocols for abortion. None of them mandate use of ultrasound. This is because they note that the weeks of pregnancy or the gestational age may be determined by the woman's last menstrual period date and her uterine size on exam. And so therefore, they leave the use of ultrasound to the discretion of the provider. Furthermore, medical studies have shown that the use of ultrasound before abortion does not significantly increase the chance of safe physical or psychological outcomes for the woman. Therefore, again, there's no significant public health risk that a mandated use of ultrasound would address. I certainly see that there are a number of different reasons to use ultrasound. If you feel that the uh, exam is uh, inconsistent with the woman's history or the last menstrual period, uh, there are reasons to do an ultrasound to detect multiple gestation, to detect possible ectopic pregnancy, Certainly, if we're looking for malformations, that is definitely a reason to use ultrasound in pregnancy. However, the ultrasound used to test for malformations is done only after a serum screen is done to look for fetal malformations. Um, ultrasound is not medically required in the first trimester of pregnancy during prenatal care. Again, looking to the guidelines of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. In fact, it's not covered by many insurance plans, including now Medicaid uh, managed care plans. It is not present in every physician's office, and so therefore, even though there are a lot of clinics that are providing this as part of their protocol, there are a lot of physicians in the state of Georgia who are not practicing in a clinic setting, who may be practicing in a hospital, may be practicing in a private practice setting, and they may not have 
uh, an ultrasound readily available to them, but also they're not uh, not mandated uh, by any medical body to uh, to do an ultrasound in, in either situation, whether first trimester or pregnancy again, or for an abortion. Uh, the majority of abortions in this country are performed before 12 weeks, uh, over 88 percent, and a fetal heartbeat is not audible by Doppler, um, but also uh, many ultrasound machines do not provide um, audible heartbeat uh, through the machine. It often has to be a specialized machine, so it's not, it's not readily available. Um, there can be no basis for medical malpractice or discipline from a board of medical examiners for failure to perform an unnecessary medical test which in turn would not lead to harm or injury to the patient. And therefore, certification in writing about uh, performing an ultrasound and that it was uh, provided to the patient is also unnecessary, especially since there are HIPAA rules to, uh, to protect full disclosure to the patient. Mandating additional tests that do not improve patient safety increases medical costs without improving patient outcomes. Insurance will not cover unnecessary tests, and so the burden rests on the patient. This is contrary to two ethical principles uh, that we use in medicine, primary concern for the interest of the patient and allocation for limited medical resources. I am concerned about, as well, the proposed list of free ultrasounds that are available. If there are ultrasounds that are able to be read by medical personnel, and this can be done on a free basis, then uh, that would be one thing. But if these are able to be provided free of charge because there is not medical personnel providing uh, reading about the ultrasounds, then I would be very concerned about referring patients to those facilities if there's no uh, medical review. Over 10 years of medical research has shown us that the most effective way to decrease the abortion rate is to decrease unintended pregnancies. And similarly, uh, additional barriers and additional requirements have not worked historically to decrease abortions. What they do is they result in delayed presentation for abortion and they result in attempts at self-abortion that both increase the maternal morbidity and mortality. In particular, here in Georgia, here in Atlanta, I had a patient two weeks ago who presented. She originally presented in her pregnancy, was requesting an abortion, and was told that abortion services were available. Feeling that there were too many barriers to obtaining this abortion, she went home. Her friends told her that if she took castor oil and used a coat hanger in her vagina, she could uh, self-induce an abortion. They told her that this would work. She tried it. And she came requiring hospitalization and surgery uh, for full treatment after that. Any questions? Representative Randall raised a good point earlier that um, I know I'm guilty of, and that's not being terribly knowledgeable about this. I know when I think when our children were born, it was in the uh, in another generation of ultrasounds. Um, but it, it it seems like every couple I know now that's going through a pregnancy has this. I mean, I even got a buddy that's carrying an ultrasound picture, and you would think that was a, a one or two year old child um, in his wallet. Um, can you just what percentage? of pregnancies are not, are these not utilized in? What percentage of yeah, pregnancies when, when, in the, the state the, for a first trimester? Through, Currently, yeah. because man, Medicaid doesn't cover it, uh, no Medicaid patients are receiving first trimester ultrasounds unless um, they're requesting it outside of their insurance and agreeing to pay for it. Uh, as far as private practitioners, there are many reasons why someone might get an ultrasound. And there's certainly well, that's, that's what I'm trying to focus on, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but, no, 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 but, 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 but in the private setting, how many mothers being followed are not having ultrasounds at some point in that first or second trimester? They're probably having it at some point during the second trimester because uh, current guidelines, uh, again from ACOG, say that after the triple screen, uh, an ultrasound is recommended for... Um, Fetal, to review the fetal anatomy and to look for malformations. And what about the first? No. Okay. And again, the and I'm, we're talking about the majority. Yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to find out. So, okay. We got about. Since this was Representative Setzler's idea, then I will. <laughs> Two or three minutes, to Representative Setzler, and then Representative Abrams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I'm sorry, Doctor. I want to pronounce your name right. Could you, could you give that to us once again? I apologize. Swiak. Doctor Swiak, thank you. Um, and again, I appreciate you being here. I really appreciate everybody taking the time to be here today and be part of this process. And I know you're a busy person uh, to sacrifice from your time. Um, I want to just just kind of recap some of your uh, and, and I agreed with a number of the statements you made. Um, one thing I wanted to kind of follow up with you on was was the um, idea of the heartbeat. Um, you had mentioned that um, before 12 weeks via the Doppler method, um, the heartbeat is often not audible. Um, and as we consider this, and as we look at most abortions, as you had mentioned, happening before 12 weeks in that context, um, and in the context of full disclosure, which I think you certainly support, you want people to be fully empowered to make well-informed decisions, um, if you know, there's no means without an ultrasound, to hear a heartbeat or perceive any beating of the heart of the, the child growing inside the mother, are we not without the physically seeing the little beating heart of the um, child in utero prior to 12 weeks, are we not missing critically important information to a woman making a, full, a fully informed choice? If she can't through the Doppler method hear the heartbeat, is it not true the only way that you can get this information is to see a visible ultrasound? In the first trimester? In, in, in the first 12 weeks, when 88% when of abortions are happening. Well, certainly I would say that the way to see it, since you couldn't hear it, is through ultrasound. But again, the, the, I, need, I need to go back to the fact that it's not required for any pregnancy in the first trimester, and that's because there's no evidence that shows it improves the health of women. I understand that. And again, that, that is an important issue. I'm not looking to set that issue aside. My issue is specifically with respect to full disclosure of the facts. And if in many cases via the Doppler method, which is not ultrasound, um, before 12 weeks, there's no ability to perceive the audible beat of a heart. And the only way, consequently, to then see the beat of the heart would be to view the ultrasound. Uh, under, under the circumstances when 88% of abortions are being performed, it would seem 88% of abortions are being performed with no ability to see a beating heart or perceive a beating heart in any way without the ultrasound that Representative Mills is, is proposing. I don't equate that with not full disclosure. I understand your case. I'm simply asking for the record. Is that following your line of reasoning, 88% of abortions would be performed in the context of a woman not being able to see the physical beating heart? Now, we can debate whether beating heart is part of full disclosure. I'm just simply seeking to ask that question for the record. And one more, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Sure. Um, you had mentioned before that um, no studies suggest that seeing an, that studies suggest seeing an ultrasound do not have a significant psychological or mental impact on the woman. Is that what you had shared yeah, earlier? Yeah, there's no medical data to okay. speak to that either way. Okay, are you pretty pretty certain of that? Um, certainly, yes. Okay. With the and it's to that point I would submit to the committee that if there's no significant psychological impact or mental impact to the woman seeing an ultrasound, why shouldn't why could we make the case that it's going to be a severe psychological and mental impact? by making the woman see an ultrasound. Studies suggest, in her very words, that there's no significant mental or psychological impact. Why would we want to withhold this from a woman? There's no, middle, there's no psychological mental impact. Studies have shown that, 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 that they're linked to this ultrasound. And, and I asked the question, and I wanted to make sure I heard you very clearly, because I think that's, that's frankly the point that Chairman Mills is making in bringing the bill, is there's no overwhelming psychological mental impact to seeing uh, the ultrasound and thereby it's it's there's there's value in in what he's proposing so no further questions mr Chairman. representative central representative abrams i have two questions the first is can you react to the assertion that's been made a number of times that abortion clinics operate under a lower standard of care than other obstetric facilities please i don't believe that's the case can you in fact you, in fact there are more requirements uh, in laws throughout the country, uh, including Georgia, for abortion clinics that don't apply to other to other clinics. And like I mentioned, well, a perfect example, the, there's not an ultrasound available in every physician's office. And depending on the hospital that they're working, there's not an uh, ultrasound available in every hospital. So it almost sounds like they perhaps, you know, if there's a difference, that they're operating on a higher standard. Um, and then my second question would be, can you react to the, the <laughs> 
the question I asked earlier about if the standard of care is is more attenuated or I would say certainly more intense for abortion clinics, why should, can you react to the question of why other obstetric facilities should not be required to provide an equal level of care to all women who, who seek um, information about their pregnancies? Well, I, I go back to my same line of reasoning before that if if there is medical evidence to show that we're improving the health of women, of our patients, by providing an ultrasound to any pregnant woman in the first trimester, no matter what they choose to do with that pregnancy, then by all means we should be supporting that and legislation should be supporting that. However, there's nothing to indicate that women are at substantial risk because this mandate is not in place. And if it's not if it's not a, a required uh, test by by a number of federal groups, then it, it's hard to understand why we need to mandate it in every single case for every single physician to do absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Sweet. I can thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Abrams. With that, we're going to uh, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your expertise. I hope you'll be able to come back, Dr. Sweet. Did I pronounce it right? Yes. Okay. Uh, when we next meet on this bill. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, before we adjourn, I have made some subcommittee assignments earlier, and um, uh, we will meet again tomorrow, and that will be our last meeting this week. Uh, we have an agenda already out on tomorrow's meeting, but uh, I'm hopeful that maybe Thursday or even Friday morning the subcommittees can meet because uh, some of these bills we need to have start some discussion on. Um, with that, we are adjourned. We're going to keep the sign-up sheet, and uh, we will uh, let you know when we're back together on 140s. I'm sorry, Representative Franklin. Do we know when we will have further discussions on this bill? No. Nope.